everybody. Um, thank you uh, for uh, being us with uh, with us today on this uh, lovely uh, uh, where and where I'm standing, uh, sunny and very hot uh, 11th uh, of August. Um, so uh, the topic of today will be around um, uh, the 10 tips and tricks uh, to optimize your data capture and uh, your next cl clinical trial. So to introduce myself, I'm Thierry Hiller, uh, product marketing lead at Evidentic and I'll uh, be uh, the master of uh, ceremonies today. So uh, in a summary, so what we will be uh, uh, discussing today is uh, really the data capture. Um, so is it an easy thing to do, um, but how can we do it uh, uh, efficiently? Uh, how to think outside of the box and uh, ask your EDC vendor what they could be doing differently uh, to engage sites and enhance data quality. Uh, and how to integrate other systems uh, to really make uh, your EDC system um, um, the center of your clinical world. So today's speakers uh, for the live sessions will be hosted by uh, two of our industry uh, specialists. So um, Nicole Keusley, uh, who is our executive director of customer success. Um, Nicole has really a, a vast experience in implementing ECRFs and managing various types of studies. Um, so she also leads the customer success team at Evidentic uh, and really uh, making sure that um, our customer requirements are getting fulfilled. Uh, we also have Simon Taylor, uh, who's based in the UK. Uh, so he's our head of product management and he is overseeing all the development of our uh, Evidentic e-clinical applications and to our customer hands. So. Um, uh, um, so some additional session logistics. Uh, so you can play this webcast in full screen by pushing the icon on the right corner uh, of the screen. Uh, this session will be recorded. Please also feel free to use the chat box that is private to send us any questions that you might have and that we will gladly respond to at the end of the session. Uh, also, you will see a little polls icon. So we will have two polls there um, that you can uh, um, um, review uh, to entertain yourself during the presentation. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll give um, the stage over to Nicole. So Nicole, welcome, uh, and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sari, for um, introducing us. So from my side, also warm welcome to our webinar session. So we're really happy to share our ideas and thoughts actually that comes from our daily business and working with our clients. But now I just jump right into the presentation. Um, so I think the first tip here um, that I have that I start um, is the best one to start with because it builds actually the perfect foundation to optimize your data capture. And it's fairly simple. Use data standards in your organization. Well, data standards is quite a broad word. So I, I really like it to split it into um, three levels, let's say. Um, so first of all, we have, of course, industry standards. So for example, the CDIS standards um, that maybe most of you know in this industry. Um, our Marvin EDC system, for example, follows CDIS ODM. Um, so to standardize basically um, the data structure across um, the studies that we are hosting. But of course, there are much more standards out there with different purposes. This brings me to the next level because as an organization, um, you have to pick um, what data standards mostly cover your needs or even create your own data standards. But most important is that you have a standard in your organization. And once the decision has been made, um, apply those in your daily business. And I think this is the most challenging part as it's very time consuming and different stakeholders are involved that needs to agree what you have set up um, for your organization. Um, so. Once you agreed on a general st standard, I really like to split it up into different um, trial types, study types. This can be either a three by therapeutic area, by sponsors, by phases, um, or you have other categories in an organization that um, yeah, matches more to your needs. Um, if you do this, if you split your uh, studies into the types that you need, um, that could fasten the decision making for the people who are involved in the implementation of the study. So for example, for the ESRF designer if, or, um, or the data manager who will set up an ESRF or an EDC database, that they have already a foundation that they can build on. So if you have a di diabetes um, 
study, the, you can use the diabetes standard from our, your organization and build um, from, from there instead of um, starting from scratch, which is, of course, um, time consuming. In general, establishing a standard or thinking about a, um, a standard for your organization, it's um, quite time consuming. But once you make the effort, I think it's a good investment to later on um, be more efficient in your work and, and in others. And um, from, from that, of course, um, efficiency is one part, but you can also get um, more transparency in your, um, in your data. So it promotes basically a common and clear meaning for the data that you're looking at. So people have all um, other interpretations, but if you have standards and you know and define what the standards are, um, the people have a, um, a common view how to look at the data and have a clear understanding, especially for the data that is often reused. Um, one important benefit once you establish your um, data standards is the compatibility. Um, maybe I, for the compatibility, we need to go one higher, one level higher into the industry because nowadays um, system integrations become more and more um, uh, more and more relevant for us. Um, so we see that the trend is there that um, our um, our systems need, needs to be integrated with other systems. They need to talk with each other. It's like with us humans. The better we speak a common language, the better we can exchange information and the same applies for software products. And we should be part of it and we should be part and, um, and be involved in the industry to, um, to, to establish a, a standard that we can exchange easily. Like for example, the CDS ODM standard. Um, as um, one of my a benefit in in my list is of course analysis because if you extract the, da the data and always in a standardized way with the same terms with the same coding so the data structures, this make it makes it easier or speed up the data analysis for the statistician. You can reuse um, your stat scripts and um, you can faster better understand um, the data that you're looking at if you know um, the concept of the data structure. As um, last benefit on my list is basically to simplify and harmonize your process steps during your clinical trial, like setting up your metadata. So it starts there, but of course, also at the end, um, the, um, the submission of your data where also typically a, a, a required standard um, is needed. This brings me actually to my next step. Um, so. At the end of the day, we must submit data, right? So um, independent where the submission takes place, even uh, if it's in, the uh, in a regulatory body or an internal submission, um, you have to submit your data. Um, we, let's have a look into the see this end-to-end -end approach because I really like the idea of it um, and I like to give a simple view on it. Um, so um, assuming that you need to submit your data um, and the FDA, for example, or the Japanese um, PMDA, um, you have to submit SCTM data and database tables, which you can see in the yellow box on the right side. Um, on so the SCTM, well, the SCTM is you need to follow a quite strict rule on how the data set should look like and how you need to submit your data, and it's very rigid, so you do not have really freedom there. And on the other hand, on the other opposite side, the direction you have what you can see in the upper green box, the ODM standard, so the one that we are using in our EDC systems, which is not required by any regulation. Um, so in fact, this model gives you actually the freedom to design the ESRF as you prefer. Um, it only tells you um, the, how your data is structured. But you have to somehow achieve um, the structure that, um, that you need to submit um, for the SCTM standards. But the good side is that both standard standards are from the same family and share the same concepts and ideas. So it makes it then easier to get from the green box to the yellow box. Um, if you put in another layer, so um, the C dash standard, um, in addition to the, to the ODM standard, you will get closer um, to SCTM because the CDISH is a standard um, that harmonizes um, the data collection with SCTM. 
So it's basically a content model or content standard um, that it, um, tells you how the data should look like um, and the content of the data. Um, so that in the end of the day, um, the work to link your ECRF data with um, STM data, um, data um, sets so the, that the work will get less. CDS end-to-end, -end, to summarize, that basically means to use CDS standards in every process step. And um, I think most important is also to think ahead how your uh, data look like. So have a look how your SDTM data um, submission tables should look like and work backwards from there and then work backwards and design um, your ECRF upon those tabulation data. It's actually, so this way of thinking, thinking ahead, you can apply this independent from any kind of data standards. You do not, not really need to follow, you know, the CETA standards, it's just for you. Um, it's important that you know, how do I want to look at my data? What kind of data sets do I want to, um, to have in the end of the day? And how do I want to analyze it? And then go backwards of it. And maybe this goes against the way we think because um, we put submission chronologically at the end of the process and do it typically at the end of the process. But ideally, we have to think already ahead, think about already about the submission and then work backwards um, to, the, to, the, to the ECRF. The advantages of, of that is that um, you make sure that all the data that you need to submit are collected in the ECRF. Um, and of course, that the data later on is correctly coded. You have um, the correct terms in your, um, in your data sets if you think ahead. And um, a nice advantage would be that the mapping instruction um, is already done um, before the study start, instead of um, at, at the data lock, at the, after the database lock, um, and uh, where you ha will have reduced work at that point of time. Okay, um, so I'm still, for the next tip, I still stay in the same topic, um, but I'm getting more, a little bit more precise. So mentioning an example, um, what le let's say methodologies would support um, the CDS end-to-end -end approach. Um, so my next step would be actually with when you build your metadata and build your ECRF definitions, um, it is recommended that you follow, um, um, for example, the C NCI and control terminology, or you choose proper variable names already at the beginning of your um, F of your metadata. So thinking about SDTM again, SDTM submission tables, you have really strict tables, you have the exact variable names that you, you need to follow, you have the codes that you need to follow. And if you consider that already at the beginning in your design, for example, um, as you can see here in your predefined codes, like yes, no, or mild, moderate, severe, I often see um, that people um, use numeric codings like one zero for yes, no, one, two, three for mild, moderate, severe. But actually um, the SCTM guidelines say that you have to use the exact coding from the control tem terminology with the uppercase Y, uppercase no. So if you already consider that in the design, you will get the, the data already in a way where you do not need to trans transform the data into the correct format. And yeah. Actually, the same applies for variable names as well. So um, name your variable names according to the codings, like SysBP for um, systolic blood pressure, IE I term for um, adverse event term, and so on, so that you can reuse the existing information later on for the, um, for the mapping at the end, and you do not need to um, think and, and make some interpretation and what data point, what parameter should go later on in the in your SETM tables. Again, I have to repeat myself. It does not um, does not apply only if you need to submit your data with STTM um, tables. It applies um, with all uh, with all concepts that you know how you want to have your data in the end. Okay, so um, now I would to go a little bit outside of this standard that I have talked a lot about um, a lot about of standards and there and I want to talk about another aspect um, during in a clinical trial and this is what I see very often um, at the beginning of the study or especially 
um, when customers work the first time with a new EDC system is that screening failures and dropouts are not really properly um, uh, properly um, handled um, in the EZRF. So if you start programming an EZRF, you kind of basically um, create your parameters, create like edit checks um, um, at the beginning, but mostly um, it does not, it, sometimes you do not really think, okay, how do I handle the EZRF if my patient drops out? So, or if the screening has failed. Um, so for example, for screening failures, it um, always makes sense um, to have like conditional message text so when, when your EDC system um, supports that functionality to make clear to the user that um, the patient um, was, was, um, was a screening failure and to also display the next step, what needs to be done, right? Or what happens now um, for the next, um, next step so that the site knows, okay, I'm stuck in here. Um, so um, also what is important to have to include dynamics in this in, um, at the time of the screening to only um, display those forms that needs to be entered at the time um, of a screening. Um, so that is allowed to be entered before um, you define um, that the patient has, um, has failed the screening. Um, this avoids that you enter data and then the patient has um, has been screened and then suddenly you enter data and the data should not be effective anymore. The other way around, if you have patient dropouts, that you um, implement a mechanism in your ESRF that it de deactivates the events that has not been entered yet if you have like a question, if you answered a question that the patient was a dropout and yeah, and, um, and deactivate or lock the data and you have to decide beforehand what should happen with the mandatory data that was not end entered yet. Otherwise, your patient status will be um, will be incorrect in the end. Yeah. So um, uh, I think I hand over now to Simon for um, the next one. Yeah. So thanks, Nicole. And moving on to the process, really within this trial, and when when you're thinking about where you should get your data from and what we think we should do more to get better data, is including patient data entry into your study itself. Um, the agencies and the regulators have put out a lot more about real world data evidence, uh, sorry, real world evidence, and making sure that data is correctly captured from patients and the patient voice is included as much as possible in study design, as well as in the execution of the study itself. And it's a really, really important part to think about, can you get or can you include your patients in your data entry? Um, when you've got a system or a tool that has an integrated ECOA or an ePro e platform, it allows the patient voice to be heard and all of that data to be collected in one centralized platform. So the EDC still stays as the center of your world. It still retains all of the data in the exact same format, in the exact same CDIC standard um, as Nicole mentioned. So using all of those benefits of having a standardized data approach, but you're getting that data right from the source. You know, we call it meeting the patients where they are. So exactly where the patients are, we're getting that data from them in the manner that they're comfortable submitting it um, to, which really means that that data is as accurate as physically possible when it comes from them. Because fundamentally, patient-entered data is as important as site-entered data. So we should treat it with the same care. It's something that's happening more and more. But particularly within Evidentic, it's a push that we want to see more because we believe um, that we could do it in almost every study, even if it's not been thought about before. Missing data. Um, one of those things we need to talk about is how to handle missing data. Um, it sounds like a very simple concept, but when it comes to data accuracy and data quality, um, how you think about how you handle missing data is very, very important. One, make sure you're using an interface that defines and makes it very obvious when data is missed. Some people don't, you know, it's, people aren't doing it intentionally, but having a flag that says you've missed this mandatory field, like we have within these little red icons, is a really easy and important way of getting data um, and getting CRFs captured fully and appropriately. Make sure you think about non, uh, mandatory versus non-mandatory elements. What data do you need to be captured? What data do you want to be captured? And what data might not be able to be captured everywhere? Particularly when it comes to things like registry studies, it's really important that every site potentially has the same amount of base data that they can collect. 
And then depending on the complexity and the needs of individual sites after that, they may be able to collect more data in a non-mandatory way, as opposed to trying to make everyone um, complete data in the same way. And as well, choose proper layouts. We've got an example here of a, a study that Nicole created recently where it's checkboxes against yes, no. And it's a really easy way of showing how much easier it can be for sites to collect the appropriate data and how much easier it is for them to collect it. For example, if we're using checkboxes to select all that apply and it's only one, it's a very, very different experience from them than on the left-hand side where they have to click no for all but one and they're clicking six times rather than just that one time. And whilst it's a a simple concept that sounds very, very easy to do and very obvious. These things aren't always thought about, thought out when it comes to study design because people want to capture data. But actually, what we want to do is make the experience as easy for sites as possible. The minimum amount of hassle, the minimum amount of difficulty for sites to enter data as efficiently and accurately as they can um, is the best thing for sites to go with. reporting uh, we talk about reporting a lot internally there's an awful lot um, that you can do with reports and there's all, an awful lot you can do with reports badly um, in our opinion reports should be designed to answer questions they should be telling you something whether it's retro um, retrospectively or proactively design your reports to answer those questions not just spam people with data if someone gets a big old data dump into their inbox from a report they're not going to do much with it they may go and analyze it they may not but the fact that it's not telling them something by the report being run itself tells you that it's not the right report. They should also center around key priorities and goals of your studies to make sure that all of those questions that are being answered are already within the right frame of mind and people are thinking along the right lines for what they should be doing at particular points of the study itself. Reports shouldn't just be blocks of, tests, uh, blocks of text. They should allow for decision making understanding upcoming workload and identify potential bottlenecks. Make people want to look at them. They should be visually appealing. Think of the dashboard approach to looking at data. You want people to be inundated and it should be very obvious when there is something to do from a report rather than just having to scan through a block of text. And very often bad reports don't necessarily include that. They're not thought about properly. What you wanna do is make them as visually appealing as you can Make it obvious so there's no way that someone could miss something that they should be doing within the study and make it obvious front and center. For example, put it on the home page so that, that your monitors can see all the outstanding queries that they need to, to close out for that week. As an example, is an easy way of making sure that you're using your reports to drive the workload and to drive the process day to day in your study. From that as well, reports can be tools to make future decisions. How have your sites been performing? Which sites have the most data issues? Where are you seeing the most issues in missing data? All of these things can be answered within the reports and they can be used to make future decisions, whether it's for this particular study. Is there a site that's performing badly? Or do you want to make future protocol decisions based on sites you've worked with and studies you've run before? The data will always tell you something when you look at it correctly. So when you're looking at your future protocols, when you're writing future protocols, make sure that you're looking at the data of your current and previous studies when you make those protocol decisions, when you make those study decisions, and when you make those operational decisions of how are we going to go about this? What are we going to do? Are we having patients come in too often? Do we need to delay the visits a little bit for patients to in increase our compliance and our adherence? All of those things can be answered when you look at reports and you look at the data within your study correctly. Back to Nicole. Thank you, Simon. Another aspect um, that I've, I've experienced in the past years is also that um, medical coding is um, often um, done outside of the EDC system. So it's even done in, um, in a SaaS environment or in an Excel environment. But I think, or we believe that um, a, an integrated coding tool um, helps a lot um, to, to improve your process during coding. So um, for example, that you enter an adverse event term or even a medical term into in, in a concomitant medication. And, and this term from the EDC system um, pushes data from, um, from EDC to a coding tool. And this coding tool is built up in a way that it integrates um, dictionaries, Hudrag, um, Medra dictionaries, or other dictionaries. And in, in that tool, you focus really on assigning codes for your terms, for example, like headache and apply search functionalities there. Um, if, 
independent if you find the code or um, or if you don't find a code or you think that the verbatim that was entered by the site is, was ambiguous, this information should be looped back into the EDC system so that um, you basically get an immediate feedback um, what um, was wrong or what was um, or if something was um, successfully entered into the EDC system. So um, I think this looping um, looping back the information back and forth, is um, is very beneficial since you speed up your process and cleaning your data um, and um, assigning tasks um, and get feedback from directly from the sites. Um, so for the coding tool, actually, there are a lot of coding tools out there. And I think the most important thing is that you choose the proper coding tool that feeds um, 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 that meets your needs um, in your um, organization. And, but the most important thing is to choose a coding tool that integrates with your EDC system and not being off of the offline version, um, offline version of um, outside of your EDC system so that you can establish this um, bidirectional communication path. So back to Simon. Thanks. So the last question before we wrap up and we, before we go to our summary in the Q&A is how do your users want to enter data? How do your sites and your end users actually want to interact with your EDC in your study? They're very often not thought about when it comes to that, particularly when it comes to patients. We want to make it as easy as possible to enter accurate data. And these examples here are examples we've used in previous studies going back a fairly long way now where it's using different examples. For example, the left where you have image maps um, is an example of a rheumatoid arthritis study where the patient is choosing which joint is painful. The patient may not know the exact name for the joint. They may not be able to describe it very easily, but they can always point and click exactly where that joint is painful for them. Of course, the data that's captured in the background um, is always going to be accurate within a study and coded correctly, but making sure that the patient or the person is comfortable entering data and it's the most user-friendly way to do it can easily include, uh, can easily increase data quality. Things like scales as well. Scales as well, uh, scales have been included in ePros now for a little while and they're a really, really good way of capturing data. Whether you use numerical scales or you're using um, verbal scales to capture data as well is a good way of getting information to be described accurately and giving them a framework uh, in which they can describe um, their particular questions. And the last one as well, we've also got another image uh, image map. This one happens to be of the heart, where we're using very, very accurate clicks to be able to define exactly in the heart where a particular issue was, where a surgeon saw a particular issue within a patient, and they may have changed the valve, they may have done uh, another aspect within surgery. But again, it's it's thinking outside the box and making it easy for those users to click and to choose exactly where they need to, because it means that the data you get on the other side. Um, is completely accurate with what you want within your study, rather than allowing free text fields, um, which can lead to some wayward comments and some wayward data that is often hard to interpret. Okay. So with that, that's all the tips we have for today, at least. Um, I think we hand back to Thierry for uh, some Q&A. Yeah, thank you, uh, Simon. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for the great presentation. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, so I learned uh, something today. So, yeah, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so um, the first one I have for you is um, uh, non-mandatory data is generally uh, of no statistical benefit. Um, I can see it being useful for marketing studies. Are there any other examples of which you can think? Um, particularly when it comes to, oh, well, yeah, that was the question, Simon. Yeah, I just I was just typing an answer to that as well. Yeah, I just um, said it. Yeah, one of the just to, to explain that one as well, one of the best places to not use mandatory data is when it comes to asking patients questions, particularly in PROs. Um, the guidelines put out by the FDA and the EMA are more and more and are, are increasingly not making patients answer questions they're not comfortable with, giving them the option to skip it if they're not comfortable answering it. And whilst Mark's point is correct of it may lessen the statistical benefit. It means that we're we're really making sure that the people answering the questions, particularly patients, are comfortable with what they're answering. Um, so it's a balance because if you have too many mandatory fields, data can become very unwieldy and time consuming and, and people can get put off by systems. But if you have too many optional questions, um, it can lead to um, not enough compliance with data. 
Okay. Thank you uh, for this segment. Another one we have is um, uh, the coding terms in Medra. Um, so I see, uh, are, are we support Medra, um, coding terms from Medra for, pating, for patients' language not supported by the system like Arabic? Uh, so Medra does support multi-language, including Arabic. Um, I'm pretty sure it does support um, all languages, including the Cyrillic languages, I think. I'd have to go back and check the actual Medra um, okay. dictionaries, but I'm pretty sure that it does. Okay. Okay. So another question that we have is, um, any tips to speed up uh, the study build when it's urgent? Nicole? Yeah, I think, I think um, when it's urgent, so... Um, what we tend to do um, is basically splitting up the um, in ECRF. So, of course, the goal is, to uh, is always to have a complete ECRF set up with all the edit checks and all the dynamics um, within one, let's say, go live. Um, but um, we've seen also um, methodologies that you just go live first with, with the um, screening visit and um, maybe set up the randomization methodology already um, at the beginning and then you can amend your ECRF and, and also um, then add the edit checks um, afterwards. Um, our EDC system, for example, um, if you upload the edit checks um, afterwards, it also retrospective, re retrospectively um, checks your data and um, triggers a query where um, the, rate for the values, for example, outside of the range um, so that you can f basically focus on um, the first patient end and that the necessary data are, are collected at that visit. So I think this um, is a more, let's say, um, agile approach than what we used to had um, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, another question that popped in, it, it, they keep coming. It, uh, will it be more efficient to get NK or ND answers instead of a non-mandatory data? Mm. And, and so uh, an empty data. I think it depends on the study, really. Um, I really like more, um, actually more the NK or like not, not known or not done approach because there um, you have explicitly um, the, um, the answer if a, a data is missing or not instead of um, having a mandatory non-mandatory status. So um, I think, yeah, um, um, for um, the person who asked this question, I agree um, to um, have not known and not done for most of the um, most of the studies and study types but of course as simon said there are um, like for example um, patient information or um, other like phase four marketing studies where you where not known and not done might be a little bit more time consuming or um, let's say less efficient than for a phase three phase two study mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay thank you uh, how do you deal with uh, the safety of the data uh, you mean um, uh, data, uh, the PV safety data? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's 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 data safety in general. I think it was safety data. I saw that question earlier. I think it was safety data. Okay. Um, so um, there are different approaches to how to handle um, safety data. So. And we, what we have done in the past are, uh, for example, notifications that we um, schedule, like for example, a mailing notification that checks the databases against um, the existence of um, serious adverse events um, and extract the data in a format that the client wants. So for example, it's an XML attachment that contains the necessary data or a PDF attachment that they need to submit to um, the, pharma, the pharmacovigilance um, um, department. What we've also done now in the past, and that was quite prominent in the in the past years, are creating ETB data. So, or um, we actually get the request if we can do that. So, um, ETB is the standard um, to uh, how to report um, your safety data, and uh, actually it goes to a little bit into the direction of my tip in the first, in the beginning that you basically create a standard for your adverse event form that um, could also match or that can easily be map mapped to um, ETB parameters, and then send it, um, extract every night, for example, and send automatically to an, an external PV system. So this is what we have done in the past so far. 
Okay, so I don't see any more questions, so I think we, we have them all. So uh, again, uh, Simon and Nicole, thank you for the great presentation today. Uh, so you can contact us further uh, for any uh, further questions you might have. And for all the people attending, uh, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll hope to uh, see you or talk to you uh, uh, very soon. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks a lot.